Hey, uh, coming up on Roland Martin Unfiltered for Tuesday, April 30th, 2019. More tributes pouring in after the death yesterday of director John Singleton. We'll see some rare footage of him testifying before Congress a year after Boys in the Hood came out. And I'll also talk to pioneering black director Michael Schultz. It was Michael Schultz who directed Cooley High that inspired him, that inspired John Singleton to become a movie director. So look forward to that conversation with Michael Schultz. Another Republican attempt to overturn the will of the people, this time in Missouri. Why are we shocked? They don't care what voters decide. Also, the co-founder of Black Lives Matter is also the co-founder of a women's political action group has raised 60 million bucks. We'll tell you exactly what they're going to do with it. Alicia Garza is here to chat with us. Also, black female politicians and activists rallied to support Minnesota Congresswoman Ilhan Omar here in the nation's capital. We live stream the event. We'll also share with you what Congresswoman Ayanna Presley, activist Angela Davis, and Omar had to say at today's rally sponsored by the Women's March. Also, we've got an update on the Bennett College accreditation problems from their president, Dr. Phyllis Dawkins. And the winner of last night's American Heart Association uh, sponsored contest to improve health outcomes for African Americans, a partner with HBCUs, got checked for 100 grand. We'll show you exactly who won. It's time to bring the funk. I'm Roland Martin Unfiltered. Let's go. It has been a stunning last 24 hours as the folks all across the country and the world have been sharing the remembrances of famed director John Singleton. This is an Instagram post uh, made just a few moments ago by comedian Chris Spencer. It says, I've known this cat since we were 11 years old, so this one hurts. R.I.P. John. As I said, folks all across the spectrum, whether you're talking about people on air and off, a longtime friends and colleagues of John Singleton have been sharing their thoughts. Of course, yesterday uh, he died at the age of 51 after suffering a massive stroke just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, among the folks uh, who have been sharing their thoughts uh, is director Jordan Peele. This is what he had to say uh, about uh, John Singleton. Guys, pull that up, please. Uh, R.I.P. John Singleton, so sad to hear. John was a brave artist and a true inspiration. His vision changed everything. Jada Pinkett Smith uh, had this to say about him. Uh, she said, uh, go right to it, guys. All right. Okay, it's freezing for some reason. Martin Lawrence said, my heart and prayers go out to the amazing filmmaker, father, and human being, John Singleton. His legacy uh, that has been filled with so much uh, positivity and creativity will surely stand the test of time, R.I.P. brother. Again, all kind of folks. Uh, and I told you yesterday, Tyrese had a very emotional uh, post uh, with regards uh, to John Singleton. Taraji Henson, she also uh, posted uh, something uh, as well. Uh, a number of uh, images. Uh, let go right to uh, my iPad, Henry. This is what Taraji Henson posted. My heart is broken. I'm at a loss for words. Can't stop crying. I will miss you, my dear friend, John Singleton. You gave me my first big break in Baby Boy and again in Hustle and Flow. You believed in me when Hollywood did not get me at all. Throughout my career, when I needed advice, it was you I called and you answered each and every time with sound advice. You noticed my funny and comedic timing long before Hollywood caught on, and you named me Lucy after Lucille Ball. My God. Up next for us was the Emmett Till story. I am just broken. God bless you, your mom and your beautiful babies and family, praying for all of our strength as we try and move on without you. My God, my God, uh, John Singleton, Regina King, of course, uh, who won an Oscar this year uh, for If Beale Street Could Talk. Uh, her fi first film was in Boys in the Hood. This is what she had to say uh, about John Singleton. Pull it up, please. Uh, we have it. All right, folks. Um, 
Uh, and so Regina King, again, as I said, uh, won the Oscar this year. And one of the things that uh, she also, this is what she said, rest in power, my friend, one of the greatest to ever do it. Thank you, God, for blessing us with this gift, better known as John Singleton, having trouble finding enough words to share just what you mean to me. We'll always love you, John. Your spirit will forever shine bright. Uh, one of the things that also uh, jumps out is that uh, Kelly Carter, the undefeated, hopefully we'll try to get her on this week. Uh, she wrote a piece uh, today that was pretty interesting. She said for the last 12 years, she would leave her seat at the Oscars and she would always go to a nearby bar. And the person who would always be sitting at the end of that bar was John Singleton. Uh, and this year, she talked about how it pretty much was a year where many of the people John Singleton actually put in movies behind the camera, in front of the camera, won Oscars. Regina King was one of those folks. Also, Pete Ramsey for Spider-Man worked on John Singleton's film as well. It was sort of, and she said to him, she said that uh, them winning, John, also meant uh, you winning. And so, uh, again, uh, so many people are still shocked and stunned that he is dead at the age of 51. Now, uh, one of the movies that caught his attention early on was the movie Cooley High. Uh, it is considered uh, a black cult classic. Uh, if you black and have not seen Cooley High, trust me, uh, your black card should be revoked. Uh, and he saw that film, and uh, one day he saw his mom crying watching the movie. He said, Mom, why are you crying? And she said, because of this film. And he said, he said that's what I want to do make the kind of art that can move someone emotionally. Well, the person who directed Cooley High is the famed director, Michael Schultz. He joins us right now. Uh, Michael, glad to have you on Roller Martin Unfiltered, brother. Hey, it's good to be here. Um, you know, too bad is such a sad occasion. Uh, it, it, it has to mean something to you uh, that Cooley High, which in course, those of us who love it, before a guy like John Singleton watching that film, one of the films that sparked his imagination, which led to him going to film school, finishing at 22, starting on Boys in the Hood at 23, and being the first, uh, the youngest, uh, and the first African American nominated for a Best Director for an Oscar, uh, has to uh, uh, feel special for you. Well, his whole career uh, felt special to me. Um Back in 1990 or 91, I forget the exact year, he was in his senior year at USC, and I happened to, they invited me to screen Cooley High there and then do a Q&A afterwards. And after the Q&A, this young black guy runs up to me and he says, hey, my name is John Singleton and, and I'm going to make my own Cooley High. <laughs> and, and I said, uh, that's great, brother. <laughs> All power to you. You know, and then a year later, I see Columbia Pictures producing John Singleton's Cooley High. It, I was so proud, you know. Um, he, he told me that how the film affected him, but I never heard that story about him sitting with his mother. Um, so, and that he was seven years old at the time. And what it told me, you know, his response and many other uh, young people's response, black and believe it white, um, that film affected them so much that I realized what I had known all the time that people kept telling us, no, no, what the images that you see on film don't really affect people, don't really matter. For us, they matter incredibly. And being able to affect the way people think about who we are, uh, the, to be, uh, and John did that. He did that his whole career. And, um, uh, I've always been very, very fond of him and proud of him. Well, one of the things that, uh, and it was amazing as I was reading so many stories, he only did eight films. Right. I mean, you don't have to do a lot. I mean, he produced, he produced, <laughs> he produced, uh, he produced a, a, a number of other films and did television as well. And, and yeah. I guess I sort of, uh, what, what came to mind uh, is Ralph Ellison. Mm. And you think about Ralph Ellison, the number of books that he did in his career. Right. Two? 
You know, and so right. and and so th th that is still just astonishing the impact that he had. Eight movies. Exactly. It, it, it's not about quantity. It's it's about quality and it's about what the story that you are telling people. And when you touch on that nerve, it's never forgotten. When you look at some of these tributes, when you look at the individuals uh, who he put in movies first, you think about, again, Boys in the Hood, Maury, uh, Morris Chestnut, first movie, Ice Cube, first movie. Uh, you had, of course, um, Regina King, first movie, Nia Long in the movie. Uh, when you think about uh, the folk, uh, you know, Cuba Gooding Jr., as well as, uh, you know, Angela Bassett, and a lot of these people, you know, first time in major roles and leads, and you think about, mm -hmm. uh, and, and so you go down got down the line, I mean, and here was somebody who was 23. Right. Who, right. And then and it was, what was a crazy story. He literally said that he was figuring out how to direct as the movie was going on, and body got to really like the third part of the whole process he said then i started taking some chances i mean he i mean this is his first <laughs> film <laughs> right and lawrence fishburne uh was a big help to him i uh, i i knew lawrence from years ago back in the theater and he was telling me during the process of filming he said got this brilliant young filmmaker you know but but uh he needs he needs a lot of help, but he's doing a great job. And then of course it comes out, and then he gets nominated for for an Oscar, and he's yep. 24 years old, and folks are going, "What in the world is going on?" Um, a lot from 24 to 51, and him passing away. Yeah. Um, yeah. What amazing. What, and he had, you know, what what kills me is that he had so much more to offer. So I I hate seeing a life like that cut short um, and uh, but the brother uh, left us a legacy that is critically important and uh, I hope all the folks out there uh, if they haven't seen all of his films go through and do their own film class mm -hmm. and watch them from one to eight uh, the, mm -hmm. the photos we're seeing right now, folks, these are images uh, that uh, from my uh, photo archives, uh, the one with David Oyelowo uh, took place at Oprah's home uh, when they screened Selma. This is, of course, the photo from American Black Film Festival. Uh, this is an image that Mar Mario Van Peebles sent us. We had him on the show uh, on yesterday. Uh, mm -hmm. This image here is when I interviewed uh, John Singleton at the American Black Film Festival in 2017. Uh, and this is a shot here. Uh, of uh, Ava DuVernay that I shot at both of them and sent to her. And what's interesting, Michael, so, so, we, so we were at, 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 at Oprah's house and this was after the brunch that Sunday uh, and we're taking photos and, and, so, and so John had, had this camera, um, uh, and I, I think it's, I forgot the name of the brand, uh, but, uh, and so we're sitting here uh, taking these different photos and he, and, and, and he was so intense just getting the right photo uh and he was like no i'm gonna take it i'm gonna take it with my camera i was like john get in a damn photo and so like we literally had to, had to almost strangle him to give have him give up the camera just to get in the photo uh right. he just want, he but so he was taking with david oyelo ava duvernay uh and others uh and it was it was just so hilarious though and so we so we had this conversation about cameras uh and about and and just photos and, 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 and different images. And, and uh, I forgot who was saying next to us. They were sort of looking at us going, like, are the two of y'all literally sitting here having this really deep conversation about cameras? And, and I tried to explain to the person that, look, I mean, th this is what you do. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, you are enamored with the craft. And so whether or not it's a, whether it's a video camera or a still camera, I mean, you always want the quality shot. Exactly. <laughs> and, and always finding the, the next best piece of equipment to tell your story you know yeah thank th thank god uh, it's all a tax write-off uh with all of uh, all of the gear that, that that i have you're absolutely right um when, when you think about uh the conversation the two of you had what's what stands out uh i i just wanted to show this uh, picture with uh, john and sydney portier wow uh, 
and um, and me, it may be a little blown out. No, no, no. We see it. We see it. We see it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, at the Directors Guild, we were doing a tribute to Sydney. Um, so I'm looking forward to doing a tribute to John at the DGA. Um, your question was, what stands in, out in terms of conversations the two of you had? You know, he. We were always talking film. And um, what always stood out to me uh, with John was his kind of relentless desire to show the, the people that he grew up with, the people that he knew, to really um, put that picture up to the world so that there would be an understanding of of who he was, of who they were, of who we are, you know? Um, that's basically it. And the fun, that he, had, he always had a twinkle in his eye like he was up to something. Uh, very true, know? very true, uh, very <laughs> true. Uh, if the folks uh, in the control room, if y'all can get that 13-second clip of when we were at ABFF, uh, it was so funny because also he tried to come off as he was a hard. Uh, but you're right. He because he, he, he goes because we have this clip where so we're we're we finished the Q and A and we're taking photos and and so all the photos are the same. We're just standing there smiling. So I was like, okay, now it's time for a fun photo. And so then I sort of uh, you know uh, did this really fun expression. And John just sort of stood there. And I'm like, damn it, John, get, get, have a fun pose. He's like, okay, I'm gonna do a fun pose. And it was a it was a scowl. I'm like, that's that's the best you can do. So y'all go go ahead and roll that video. <laughs> Tasha Witt and Griggs with TV One Publishers. She sent me this yesterday. So y'all roll this. Mm. We're going to do a phone one. That's your phone now? Goddamn, come up with a phone. You do that and I'll be like... Yeah. <laughs> So okay, so it's like he, so he always tried to have this hard look, but 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 it was uh, was a, a little sly smile on his face. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, that's who he was. Well, Michael Schultz, first of all, uh, we greatly appreciate. Uh, all of your work. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, Tiffany Lofton, who is the NAACP uh, Youth and College uh, Division uh, uh, director, uh, probably a couple of years ago, we were, mm -hmm. um, I, was, I was watching uh, Car Wash and we were texting uh, right. and she had the audacity to say that she had, now Tiffany's about, Tiffany just turned 30 uh, right. and, and she said she had never seen Car Wash and I literally cussed her out. Uh, and I told her she would never be allowed to be on my show again unless she watched Car Watch. And so she had, so she literally came up with some friends that night uh, to right. my house to watch Car Wash. Uh, and and so so I have a, a standard. My niece will tell you, everybody, if you do not watch Cooley High or Car Wash, you cannot be on my show. You can't be in my house if you black <laughs> because your black card will be revoked. Those two are on the list. Two movies right. you directed. Well, well, thank you. <laughs> thank you for educating people. <laughs> well, Michael, we appreciate your work and all that you've done. And uh, I look forward to getting back out to L.A. and you and I sitting down uh, to have a great one-on-one right. uh, -on -one conversation for our unfiltered audience. We appreciate it. Thanks Absolutely. a lot. Absolutely. Looking forward to it. Take care. All right. Thanks a bunch. Uh, folks, we talk about, of course, filmmaking, but many folks did not realize that John also was about public policy. Congresswoman Karen Bass tweeted this video out. It was when John Singleton appeared before Congress uh, the year after Boys in the Hood came out talking about the impact of public policy on the lives of young African Americans. Some boys and girls may choose sports, reading, or an artistic endeavor. For children in, in most inner cities, there is no such rite of passage that is clearly defined. And it's more difficult for a young American citizen to get a high school diploma than to get a gun. So with that, we really can't focus on the aftermath of the problem, our children living under violence, until we start to dissect the causes of this disease. And that lies in the quality of life in our youth. It's my belief that the prime factors that motivate children to drop out of school, steal, sell drugs, and possibly murder each other is the quality of their lives. Now, we could all say the responsibility that all the responsibility of, of the lives of these children lies solely with their parents. This is not wholly truth. All children growing up in this country should have the same rights when it, when it comes to growing up into a responsible citizen. When the quality of their lives are made dysfunctional, the people are made inept. 
when the people are unable to take action against their frustrations, then the society in which they live becomes dysfunctional. If a child loses hope and doesn't believe he or she can affect the quality of life around them, then it makes it easier for them to disrespect themselves or their peers and the community in which they live. Whereas the actions of these children are, are in reaction to their quality of life, the inaction of federal and state governments towards any positive change is by far a more violent act. Why does more federal and state funding go towards prisons than education? Isn't it common sense to understand that we can't put everybody in jail and that it would be more positive if we work towards raising a population of citizens to be assets to this country instead of dependents? American right now is a dysfunctional family, and its children in some places in this country are only acting out the dysfunction of their elders. By investing in our children, we reap the fruit of what we once were and what we can't be as, as a country. If the federal government does not start working towards a positive future for our children, then imagine what damage the next 10, 15, 20 years hold for our country. If we raise a population of indifferent youth, you can expect far more incidents like the LA riots that will not be exclusive to larger city, American cities. This would be the ultimate violent act, and we would only have ourselves to blame and not our children. Peace. All right, folks, let's bring in our panel, Malik Abdul, Vice President, Black Conservative Federation, Kelly Bethea, Communications Strategist. Also joining us, Alicia Garza, co-founder of Black Lives Matter, and Mustafa Santiago, Santiago Ali, former senior advisor for the environmental justice at the EPA via Skype. Um, I want to start with um, you, uh, Alicia. Um, the, the reason... We're doing this today and we're going to do it again tomorrow and then Thursday and Friday uh, is because I, I've always I've always had an issue when great African-Americans pass and it's essentially ignored by mainstream. His obit, obviously, L.A. Times, New York Times, all these different places like this here. But I also think it's, it's, it's different for African-Americans for us to properly pay tribute and unpack the life of someone great. And when you think about film, when you think about what John Singleton, what he put on the screen, I think about Frederick Douglass, how he was very deliberate with taking photos because he wanted for the purpose of history, for people to know how black people looked in the 1800s. And then if you compare the portraits of Frederick Douglass looking very astute, uh, in his clothing to whites of the time as well, people have to understand the power of images and why us framing it is critically important. And that's what John Singleton did. Mm -hmm. So the question is... Speak to that issue. <laughs> yeah. Well, listen, I mean, first of all, John Singleton was incredible and his loss is devastating, not just to black communities, but I think to art and culture and film. John Singleton was one of the first to um, really portray conditions in uh, black communities across America. He was one of the first to, uh, to demonstrate the process of gentrification, right? I mean, a lot of how I learned about what gentrification was was through watching John Singleton movies, where he's bringing social, economic, and cultural issues to the forefront and in a lot of ways into the mainstream. And it is true that black artists and black influencers, and not influencers on Twitter, I mean like people who are shaping our society, uh, are not only not lionized while they're alive, but they're also not lionized when they die. And we do have an opportunity to change that. I think we are in a moment where it is important not just to uh, lift up whatever controversies may have surrounded his art, but also to lift up the ways in which he uh, really advanced not only the careers, but the art of uh, a number of black artists that have literally changed the entertainment industry. And Kelly, that's why I think if you say eight, only doing eight films, and obviously doing television and producing other films, but it was the folks who he was able to bring in. When you talk about Spike Lee as well, uh, I, I always I always make the point um, when I look at uh, when I look at cable news, when I look at 
the folks who, who are black and I'm seeing them on MSNBC and CNN and I'm going, but I also know when I put them on television first, that was deliberate mm -hmm. because a lot of people don't understand that you can actually impact broader society just elevating people in your space where you're not necessarily have to, you don't have to be the CEO of a network, but in your space, if you use your space to elevate others, then you can actually change mm -hmm. society. And I think and when you look at the roll call of people who he put in movies first and how they've been able to just branch and go on and on and on and then also replicate what he did, that's how I think you utilize your power. So although he dies at 50, 51, the impact goes far beyond him living, him passing away in 2019. No, absolutely. Not only did he impact those people who he brought in, he paved the way for people who didn't even know him personally until they were in the space of John Singleton, such as Jordan Peele and Ava DuVernay and other black directors, producers, what have you. Um, the, the loss is great. Um, the movie that impacted me the most, um, while every, a lot of people are talking about, yes, uh, poetic justice, Boys in the Hood, the like, my movie is Rosewood. Mm -hmm. Because not only um, with, with Boys in the Hood and poetic justice, higher learning, we, we saw what black people are like in the era that we were in. Right. And then Rosewood taught us that history was really just repeating itself, right, in terms of our status in society, how we had to navigate things, but also the fact that peop our people were still excellent right. in that era. And I had never seen a movie in that context before Rosewood. So for me, that that's that's my movie. That is that's what my impact was. Mustafa, when you think about what is mine, the reality is when he sent his script uh, for Boys in the Hood, when they said let's do this, he was adamant. I will direct it. And, okay, think about it. You're, he's 22 years old, just out of film school, major studio, and he says from the get-go, no one else is going to direct this. I am going to direct it. That is important when you talk about owning your voice and controlling the narrative. Without a doubt. I mean, I, I think it shows that he had a very early understanding about power and how to make sure that you are pulling all the pieces together, that you are framing out the narrative, that you are telling the narrative, and that you are retaining the rights that are so necessary to make sure that we don't lose control of our stories. When I think about people like Melvin Van Peebles, when I think about Gordon Parks, I put John in that same category because they're telling our stories and they're telling them in an authentic way, but they're also making sure that there's power in that process. And I think that that's so important and so many people miss that. Malik? Um, you know, I, 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 I actually um, listen to, you know, a lot of the conversation that people have been having about him. Um, so I, will, I will say my movies, I really am a huge fan of Poetic Justice. Um, in part because Tupac is in that movie. And it's actually, I don't know if that's the only movie that he's ever been in, um, but- No, no, he's been in many other several. Yeah, movies. but that but that was one of the ones that I always remember. And Kelly, you actually got my Rosewood one <laughs> because my mother and I were talking about this. And yeah. that's one of the movies that we think about because it's one of those, you know, there are a lot, it, for me, it was um, similar to what, um, school days was, you know, yeah. when, when I watched things like higher learning, mm -hmm. poetic justice, because it's talking about specific issues at that time, mm -hmm. ironically, that we're still dealing with today. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, you know, applaud his legacy and hope that we in platforms like this, you know, that we're able to use these platforms to really honor our um, people when they're here, well, not just when they're gone. So. Well, when I interviewed him in 2017 uh, at ABFF, we talked about Baby Boy, and I, uh, he got a huge, Jody. he got a huge laugh because I hated Baby Boy. <laughs> Literally, I, I saw Baby Boy, and I, I despise. I wanted I to like whoop it. Jody's ass. I didn't like. It. You don't understand. I can't stand sorry ass me. I don't like Baby Boy. I can't. Boy. But I'm glad you said it. No, 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 no. John Holland. He yeah. he said no, no, no. You were supposed to hate. Jody. Everybody. And so we had this huge, okay. I mean, he cracked up laughing when I said, dude, you don't understand. Mm -hmm. I could not watch Baby Boy 
for five years after it came out. Everybody I saw it and was pissed. Mm-hmm. I was like, John, you're on the... And so I said, then, when I watched it again, I said, so now... I said, it, for me now, I said, baby boy went from a drama to a comedy. <laughs> and, and, oh, he hollered. I mean, car, he no, hollered. I, 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 I just said, look, I, was, I said, dude, I said, I want to whoop. I was like, being whoop his ass like being Reigns. I can't stand a sorry man. Uh, and so we're going to continue our tribute to John Singleton tomorrow right here on News 1 Now. I'm going to go to a break right now. And we'll be back. We'll come talk politics on Roller Martin Unfiltered. You want to check out Roller Martin Unfiltered? YouTube.com forward slash Roland S. Martin. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. There's only one daily digital show out here that keeps it black and keep it real. It's Roland Martin Unfiltered. See that name right there? Roland Martin Unfiltered. Like, share, subscribe to our YouTube channel. That's YouTube.com forward slash Roland S. Martin. And don't forget to turn on your notifications so when we go live, you'll know it. I was, I'm telling I'm telling I was crazy. All the things. All right, y'all. Let's get right. What are you doing? Supports our daily digital show. There's only one daily digital show out here that keeps it black and keep it real. As Roland Martin Unfiltered. Support the Roland Martin Unfiltered daily digital show by going to RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. Our goal is to get 20,000 of our fans contributing 50 bucks each for the whole year. You can make this possible. RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. Gone. All right, y'all. New Quinniac poll is out talking about the presidential campaign. I don't give a damn about that because, frankly, it's too damn early. But as to who has the best chance of beating Donald Trump, only 7% of women chose one of the female candidates. What the hell? New organization formed this week could very well address that. It's called Supermajority. The goal is to teach 2 million women to be political activists. Co-founded by the former head of Planned Parenthood, uh, Cecile Richards, also the daughter of former Texas Governor Ann Rich- Richards, uh, Jean Poole, the director of the National Domestic Workers Alliance, and our guest, Alicia Garza, co-founder of Black Lives Matter. So how did this whole thing start? Where did it come, where did it come from? Well, you know, after 2016, after we all kind of took ourselves from being curled up in a ball in the corner crying (laughs) a bunch of us from the domestic workers alliance and from planned parenthood started to meet and we started to talk about what we thought the consequences would be of that election but bigger than that we started to dream and one of the things that we saw after the election was that women are taking action in unprecedented ways Uh, i think it's something like one in five people in america have marched or protested since the 2016 election And we know that the majority of those folks have been women. We saw that with the Women's March, four million women around the world taking to the streets. Uh, We saw that through the Me Too movement. We've seen it in Time's Up. We also saw it at the Kavanaugh hearings where women literally took over the Capitol. Um, And, you know, you would think that after two years, women would be tired. But what we're finding and what we found from traveling around the country is that women are not only not tired and not burnt out, we're mad as hell and we're fired up. So that's where supermajority comes from. It's the idea that women are 51% of the population. We are 54% of the electorate. We are the majority of voters. We are the majority of volunteers. We are the majority of donors. And in fact, women donated $100 million more in the 2018 elections than we did in 2016. So. Uh, we are really aiming to build a new home for women's activism. We want to add oxygen to the fire that women are already spreading across the country. I had an interview with uh, actress Erica Alexander. It was pretty funny. Uh, her The one line from the whole interview, uh, <laughs> she said, fuck, hope, fight. Yes. And no, I mean, it, it's, I mean, you have people who literally are pissed. And frankly, there are a lot of people who are pissed, a lot of women who are pissed because they sat on the sidelines. A lot of millennial sisters who were pissed because they were like, oh, Hillary, Trump, they're the same. And all of a sudden, it's kind of like, uh, they're not. So I keep telling, Dr. King talked about this year. He said, you can be angry, but do something with your anger. That's right. Don't just be mad. That's right. And what we're finding is that women are. So what we saw in 2018 was that women really changed the balance of power in this country. We changed the balance of power in the House of Representatives. Uh, We elected a historic number of women to uh, U.S. Congress and to state legislatures all across the nation. And I I think what we're finding is that there are women who are engaged right now who have been active for, you know, 
20 years or more. And there are women who are just coming into the fight. And there's a real need to build a community for people who want to take action and who want to do more than march. Resisting is important, but winning is also important. Mustafa, I want to go to you. Two issues that, that we look at the polling data that are major. Gun control, climate change. Uh, you worked at the e EPA, and those are two major issues that women are talking about. Uh, and so whether on the Democratic side, whether it's a male or, or a female candidate, bottom line is, this is not the old elections where, oh, that's a fringe issue, it's economy, economy, economy. This has to be a much broader conversation. And so your thoughts on uh, how women will play, uh, the role they'll play in this next election with one of the issues uh, you're very close to. Yeah, I mean, they're very focused on these issues and, and they're, the issues are actually connected. You know, when you talk about air pollution, we know that more folks are actually dying from air pollution that are dying from gun violence in our country every year. But both of those are equally important. And that's why these folks who want our vote have to understand both the intersectionality, um, but also that this is a part of this new paradigm uh, that folks are, are focusing on. Um, so many different types of groups are coming together uh, and saying that if you're not gonna focus on these issues, you're not gonna get our vote. And you know, it, it's such a blessing to see so many incredible women uh, who are now leading uh, in many of these spaces, both on Capitol Hill and hopefully in the White House, uh, in the state houses, and, and even in the work that I'm doing around the country in county commissions and you know in, in local governments as well. So there's a change, and the candidates are going to have to be able to answer uh, in a very substantive way the, these things that people are asking for. Kelly? Um, um. I completely agree. Uh, especially when it comes to uh, the environment. I think, like you said, it's not a fringe issue anymore because I just came back from California. Smog is a real thing. You know, wind energy is a real thing that can actually benefit all of us uh, down the line. Um, when it comes to uh, supermajority, like uh, my panelist was saying, I think it's an excellent idea because women aren't going anywhere. If anything, we're going to be, you know, here for a very long time and perpetuate uh, any other issues that uh, arise. We will be, you know, e we will have even more leaders than we have now um, simply because of this pivotal moment in our history where we're tr people are trying to ignore us and it's just not working. Uh, Malik, you supported Trump. 53% uh, of white women uh, voted for Donald Trump. Uh, I don't think he's going to get 53% 53, 53 of white women this time. Uh, and he's got a woman problem. His numbers are down in states that he won. And even with the economy where it is, uh, he has to do, he can't win just with white men. Right. Uh, yeah, that's true. And Trump, well, the Republican Party in general, um, we've always had a women problem. Um, and so I don't think that that's going to be anything different in 2020. No, you haven't, are, you haven't always had a women problem. Again, I go back to when Newt Gingrich was Speaker of the House when they lost that particular midterm. There were white women were pissed off how he treated African American mm -hmm. Latinos. Mm -hmm. That's one of the reasons why he got thrown out. They brought in a new speaker, or actually a couple of speakers, because y'all had folks who kept having affairs <laughs> and stuff. Uh, and then when George W. Bush ran against Al Gore, white women said, I'm cool with, with uh, compassionate conservatism. Uh, the difference here is that, look, they voted for Trump. They, they fell for the okie doke. And a lot of those white women are going, what the hell did I do? They had immediate regrets. And those numbers have not, have not uh, subsided since November 2016. Well, they've been talking about, the party has been talking about the support that um, we have amongst suburban voters since, two, that, well, before 2016, but definitely after 2016. You know, there are efforts that the party is taking to address that. I don't, I'm not sure if Donald Trump will get the same number of support um, from women, you know, and then of course that number is even smaller if we're talking about black women. Um, because I think Hillary Clinton got. Oh, that number does not exist. Yeah, but but you know that that number I think. I mean, he got might as well just. I mean, four person. Right. So. It's, it's going to be Lynn Patton. But but what I will say. But what and, I will and, say. Right. Still, to, right. Right. <laughs> Cot, you know, polyester, uh, cubic zirconia. That diamond uh, and silk. That's about it. Call them diamond and silk. But I will say that you know it's important to really talk about. Um, women, but we also should not forget men. A lot of times, no, we no, forget no, no, men no, 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 no. First of all, how I stop, stop. We don't forget men, okay? Right now, I'm talking about women. Yeah, no, so, I totally okay, understand no, no. that. No, 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 we can deal with men, but I'm specifically, you're talking about women. And you have a president mm -hmm. who, who's foul, who's uncouth, 
And the reality is, because uh, when you hear the argument being made by Joe Biden, and I tweeted this when I read John Ward's book, Camelot's Inn, Jimmy Carter ran in 1976 on a moral platform, mm -hmm. restoring the, mo uh, the moral leadership character after Richard Nixon. Mm -hmm. And I actually said to several, pres several presidential candidates, that's a winning argument. Eh, folks did their own thing. I'm like, okay. Biden comes out, and what is he hitting immediately? Moral leadership, and that's the difference. You got e economic numbers are one thing, but you have women who simply are ashamed of the leadership of Donald Trump. Yes, and to be honest, we have to just say off the bat that um, what needs to happen in the 2020 election is there needs to not only be more attention paid to um, having somebody in the White House who's not plagued with scandals, but also there has to be more attention paid to making sure that women's issues don't get looked at as side issues or special interest issues. Uh, women's issues are everybody's issues and quite frankly, they're national imperatives. When we look at pay equity, um, that impacts women and families and it impacts men. Uh, when we look at issues of the environment, that impacts women and families and it impacts men. And so I think we have to start talking about our issues that way. I will also say this, women are going to decide the 2020 election. Mm -hmm. It is going to be women who are going to decide who is in the White House and who are in state legislatures across the country. We already saw a taste of that in the midterms and we're going to see it even more in 2020. And I think what we need to be mindful of is that what we're trying to accomplish here is to build the strength and the power of the movement that is already sweeping the country. Mm -hmm. And that's what supermajority is going to do. And any candidate that wants to win women is going to be paying attention to being able to speak to issues through the lens of how women experience them. And then they're going to go a level deeper. They're going to be able to speak to issues. They're going to have to articulate policies that speak to the way that women and women of color and poor women and immigrant women are experiencing those issues every single day. And if candidates are not able to do that, they are not going to win women's votes. And when you see Donald Trump consistently attacking women, you see him, whether it's Congresswoman Maxine Waters, Rashida Tla Congresswoman Rashida Tleib, or Ilhan, uh, Congresswoman Omar. Ilhan Omar. I mean, you're seeing that. In fact, today uh, on the steps of the Capitol, uh, black women, uh, were, they were participating in a march or rally organized by the Women's March uh, to support Congresswoman Ilhan Omar of Minnesota. There were a number of speakers who were there. We live streamed that event. If you go to our YouTube channel, you can actually see it. And later tonight, we'll actually live stream the whole rally again. See, that's the other thing. When you own your shit, <laughs> you can do that. So we didn't have to ask somebody to do it. That's what happens. Uh, and so, and my point is, see, see Malik, you can be a man and still cover a women's rally. Uh, and that's my point. All right, so folks, our cameras were there. And if, he, if you missed it, here's some of what took place. I am changing the things I can no longer accept. And from R. Kelly to Donald Trump, what we can no longer accept is the silencing of black women. This is the reckoning. This is us assuming our rightful place as the table shakers, as the truth tellers, as the justice seekers, as the preservers of democracy. We are demanding that you trust black women, that you see black women, that you believe black women and all of us for the world that we have played as healers and preservers of this democracy and this nation. We defend Ilhan because we, we contest the conflation of legitimate, impassioned critique of Israel with anti-Semitism and the fabrication of a notion that when the left calls for justice in Palestine, when the left supports BDS, then it has become the anti-Semitic left. This indicates a failure to take anti-Semitism seriously. If you want to effectively challenge anti-Semitism, then you must recognize the intersections and interrelations of anti-Semitism and Islamophobia. And of course, the recent attacks on synagogues and mosques are evidence of this convergence. Yes. 
I'd like to thank Jewish Voice for Peace, and if not now, for continually reminding us of this connection. And finally, as black women in defense of Ilhan Omar, we invite all who believe in freedom and justice and peace to join us. So a sister of mine on TV said, the thing that upsets, the thing that upsets the occupant of the White House, his coons in the Republican Party, many of our colleagues in the Democratic Party, is that, is that they can't stand, they cannot stand that a refugee, a black woman, an immigrant, a Muslim shows up in Congress thinking she's equal to them. But I say to them, how else did you expect me to show up? So when this, when this occupant of the White House chooses to attack me, we know, we know that that attack isn't for Ilhan. That attack is the continuation of the attacks that he's leveled against women, yes. against people of color, yes. against immigrants, yes. against refugees, yes. and certainly against Muslims. Yes. And at this moment, the occupant of the White House, as my sister Ayanna likes to call him, And his allies are doing everything that they can to distance themselves and misinform the public from the monsters that they created that is terrorizing the Jewish community and the Muslim community. Because when we are talking about anti-Semitism, we must also talk about Islamophobia. Yes. It's two sides of the same coin of bigotry. Yes. When they shove that to us and say we're the party of hate, they forget that we're the party of love. We're the party of compassion. We're the party of inclusiveness. What we are fighting for is not for the few, but for the many. Yeah. So I can't ever speak of Islamophobia and fight for Muslims if I am not willing to fight against anti-Semitism. Yeah. We collectively must make sure that we are dismantling all systems of oppression. Yeah. So this isn't a pity party for Ilhan. This is about a show of strength. Right? This is a show of strength. This is for us to say, this is for us to say that you, when you come after one of us, you come after all of us. And when one of us speaks, all of us are speaking. Alicia Garza, I want to go to you first. Uh, black women standing up for Representative Ilhan Omar, but the reality is uh, you had two men who were Muslims, uh, of course, Keith Ellison and Andre Carson. Carson was still there. Ellison is now the Attorney General in Minnesota. Okay. Now you have two women. And the reality is uh, you take those two women, you take the sister from Pennsylvania, who was actually there today as well, she spoke. Uh, you have, let's just cut to the chase, white folks in this country who do not want to see Muslims in political office. That's right. Uh, you had Ben Carson, when he ran in 2016, said Muslims should never be president of the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, her audacity to actually challenge American foreign policy when it comes to Israel is what is angering so many different people. Mm -hmm. So your thoughts about uh, the importance of folks standing with her? Congresswoman Ilhan Omar is 
a superhero. And here's why I say that. Not only was she brave enough to speak on an issue that I think a lot of people won't touch, which is the United States relationship with Israel mm -hmm. and as well as Israel's um, uh, human rights abuses. <laughs> and I, I want people to be able to be clear that I don't want her to seem like she's speaking about fringe issues. These issues matter to the American people. The reason that they matter is because, one, um, we are uh, giving millions and millions of dollars, billions of dollars in aid um, to a project that um, has a severe human rights crisis. So that's a threat to American democracy, and it's a threat to the morality of America. That's one. Uh, but Ilhan Omar is also uh, charged as a congresswoman uh, with not just speaking about foreign policy issues. Those are important. She also spoke out very uh, forcefully on Venezuela. And we know that right now, as we speak, there is a coup that has been attempted and uh, maybe attempted again. Mm -hmm. uh, Ilhan Omar has a responsibility to her constituents. And she said this today at the rally that I was really grateful to be able to be at for a little while. She said that she has a responsibility to speak for the people who elected her, which, by the way, she was elected by a landslide. She mm -hmm. had the largest margin of victory, I believe, ever for a sitting congressperson. So uh, I call her a superhero because she is uh, unbossed and unafraid. And as I said at the rally today, I think that Congresswoman Ilhan Omar has her own back. She knows how to de de defend and support uh, and protect herself. And I think our responsibility in this moment is to stand up, not just for Ilhan Omar, but it's to stand up for the women that we put into those seats right. to do exactly what she's doing. Mustafa, she really does scare Republicans for some reason. She just won. <laughs> she's just one out of 435. Well, anytime you're a strong black woman, you're always going to scare a whole lot of people on Capitol Hill. When you speak um, and the voice of Sojourner Truth comes through, you're going to scare folks. When you're willing, like Rosa Parks, to stand against injustice, you're going to scare some folks. So I have nothing but the utmost respect um, for Congresswoman Omar and how she presents herself and how she is willing to, to really be anchored in her truth um, and helping others to understand that she's trying to pull people together. And she has done that throughout her career. But she's also going to stand for what's right. She's going to stand against injustice and she's going to call it out when she sees it. Malik, um, what's up with Republicans and uh, in, in, in Omar? Yeah, I, I don't think that Republicans are afraid of Congresswoman Omar at all. I don't think we have anything to be afraid of. But I do know that there's, you know, I'm willing to acknowledge that part of this conversation that we're having about her comments. Um, really deal with the nuances of our foreign policy, support for Israel. Um, so I'm, I'm willing to concede that, that there are definitely nuances. But unfortunately, we live in a country where we really don't talk a lot of nuance, whether we're talking about race. Well, or, we do. Well, on the show. The show. But go ahead. Yeah, but, but the law. I, I just community. want to separate us from the rest of the yeah, people. Yeah, no, and you're, you're go right absolutely ahead. right. Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, so whether we're talking <laughs> about race, whether we're talking about, home, you know, sexuality, homophobia, anti-Semitism, you know, there aren't a lot of nuances. It's either black, or what? Mm -hmm. And so I think mm -hmm. part of the resistance or the response to the congresswoman, if you will, is an extension of that. So there. So we say, okay, you know what? No nuances around, you know, our, our relationship with Israel. None, zero, because we live in a society yep. where that has become the norm. And I just, like I said, I think it's an extension of the other conversations that we're having. Kelly, I don't disagree with you per se, but another angle that I've been looking at for quite some time, especially when it comes to Omar, is the blatant hypocrisy of these people who call themselves Christian, because it has nothing to do with you know, I don't think it has, it's not that it has nothing to do with her being a woman, but the predominant factor is the fact that she is a representative in um, the United States House at wearing a hijab. Mm -hmm. 
you know, because like you said, we've had. Oh, two- you saw what happened in Pennsylvania. Yeah. The day the sister got sworn in, she basically there was a, a, a white woman who gave a prayer. There was an essentially an assault mm-hmm. on that woman being sworn in. And she basically was saying that woman has no place in this state house, which is the most unchristian like thing right. that I have ever seen come out of a politician um, in my era. I'm sure there has been plenty of. Things. Oh, yeah, there have there been plenty been. of things. Been. But the fact of the matter is she is representing yep. her district well. She is one of the most American representatives we have in the House because she's doing her job so well. So the fact that we have, frankly, a bunch of, you know, older white men who are set in their ways and some other, you know, white women as well, and maybe some people of color who don't like her either because of just her being a Muslim, you know, and... it's it's hip, it's hypocritical. Yep. It's hypocritical and it's unchristian like. And for you to represent or say that you represent Jesus or say that you represent God and you're aligning yourself with Israel because you worship the same God. Keep in mind that Allah is technically that God too. So you are forsaking your brothers and sisters for what? Well, but again, that's called nuance, and so they don't like that. At least your final comment, go. Well, let's just add this nuance, and I agree with that 100%. But I think we also have to centralize this conversation in a conversation about power. Mm -hmm. And really what the response and the reaction is to is that the United States is no longer a white, male, Christian, heterosexual country. The country is changing. Demographically, we are changing. Uh, uh, Economically, we are changing. There's a lot of change that's happening. And there's a power struggle that's happening right now between uh, who will keep dominance or who will take dominance. Mm -hmm. And I think what Ilhan Omar represents, as well as Ayanna Presley and Rashida Tlaib, uh, is the change that America is becoming. And that is frightening to those who are in power, who want to keep their power. And so I want to make sure that we centralize this conversation in power because I I think it is both about being afraid of change, but it's also very much about wanting to still control where resources go. Mm -hmm. It's about wanting to still be able to control the story of who America is and isn't. Mm -hmm. It's about wanting to be able to control um, whether or not people get to make decisions over their own lives or who makes yep. those decisions. Mm-hmm. Well, and so we should contextualize this conversation. There you go. Uh, folks, some breaking news here. Uh, here we go to my iPad. Empire has been um, renewed for a sixth season, but not Jesse Smollett. Let me explain. This is a, from Deadline.com. Uh, the story says, quote, by mutual agreement, the studio has negotiated an extension to Jesse Smollett's option for season six. But at this time, there are no plans for the character of Jamal to return to Empire. His representatives uh, have released uh, a statement. We've been told that Jesse will not be on Empire in the beginning of the season, but he appreciates they have extended his contract to keep Jamal's future open. That was a, and most importantly, he is grateful to Fox and Empire leadership, cast, crew, and fans for their unwavering support. Uh, wow, Mustafa, uh, he had cl- charters were cleared, but there still seems to be a cloud hanging over Jesse Smollett's head uh, that Empire will continue, but not with him. Empire is a, is a powerful show. Um, you know, it tells many important stories. Um, it's, in, it's employed a lot of individuals. And, you know, I hope that the situation with Jesse um, gets resolved. You know, it's always interesting, Roland, that, um, you know, we give passes to so many other folks Mm -hmm. um, who sometimes get caught up in situations. Um, So I I hope that everything just kind of resolves. They just had at least a huge uh, storyline. The first two black uh, gay men married in prime time. Uh, But the way this is being played, that could be the last you see uh, Smollett on Empire. It's true. I mean, we should be concerned about uh, any time that we let the Chicago Police Department control the narrative about what happened or didn't happen. Uh, there's been a big backlash, and, and certainly there's a backlash right now against Kim Fox, who was called to testify mm-hmm. today to uh, explain the reason that her office, uh, you know, dropped charges against Jesse Smollett. Um, I think that honestly, 
I, I really hope in my heart that uh, not only is there healing that's able to happen, uh, but that restoration occurs. Uh, I will also say that I hope this doesn't turn our attention away from uh, the ways in which police departments need to be reformed. The reason that there are so many questions around what actually happened is because the legitimacy in the word mm -hmm. of the Chicago Police Department cannot be trusted. Yep. We found, uh, you know, literal torture chambers that yep. the Chicago PD was overseeing. So we it's it's hard. I, I can't speak on the details of what did happen or what didn't happen, but I can say that the consequences are uh, that we may not see those storylines again on Empire. We may. We may see them with a different actor. Uh, but the other consequences that um, certainly we're not able to trust the word of the very people who are leading this investigation to really get the news about what actually Real happened. quick, Kelly Malik, final comments. I'm a little bit shocked at this uh, response, considering that Jesse Smollett's story did not change throughout this entire ordeal. He remained steadfast in terms of what happened to him, everything regarding the situation. His story never deviated. The only uh, story that deviated were the people who were prosecuting him, either in the public or mm -hmm. behind the scenes. Um, it is unfortunate in terms of the storyline for Empire, because regardless, their ratings have been going down with or without the Jesse Smollett um, debacle. Right. Um, and it's, it's just unfortunate overall. I, I've, I've said before, I, I don't believe him. I didn't believe him when he said it. I don't believe him now. I do think that the, you know, it's Empire. They seem, you know, Lee, Dan, um, Lee Daniels, I think it is. Yeah, um, Lee Daniels. Yeah, he just seems to be making a good move. I don't think that Jesse... Not First of all, this wasn't Lee Daniels' call, the studio call. Mm -hmm. Well, the studio call. Um, but I don't think that this will affect the show, um, whether Jesse is on the show or not. But I'm perfectly fine with him not being on there because I just didn't believe... I still don't believe this. Uh, well, folks, of course, I did. I was uh, texting Jesse, and he, of course, referred me to the statement that was issued by his representatives. Uh, and so we'll uh, see what happens next with that. Uh, real quick, last night we were in, we were in uh, Greensboro, North Carolina, uh, for the American Heart Association, their initiative uh, to uh, create healthy alternatives uh, in uh, communities uh, focusing on HBCUs. Five HBCUs were finalists. Uh, let's see if I can remember them all. There were Bennett, uh, Howard University, Winston-Salem State, uh, Johnson C. Smith, Virginia State. They were the five finalists. Okay. And here is me unveiling the winner of the $100,000 grant. The winner of the American Heart Association, uh, this urban uh, health initiative, Johnson C. Smith University. All right, way to go, way to go, way to go, way to go, way to go. All right, give it up for Johnson C. Smith University. And so, folks, they're going to have a, a national initiative uh, in October. We're actually open to anyone. And so we'll have the details for you, explain to you. Uh, the competition is open on May 1st. It ends June 28th. And so tomorrow we'll begin to uh, let you know exactly how you could actually enter that competition uh, to qualify for one of their grants. Mustafa, I appreciate you being on the Today Show. Alicia, uh, Kelly, Malik, thank you so very much. Uh, folks, if you want to support Roland Martin Unfiltered, please do so by going to RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. Remember, in, early in the show when I said when you own your shit, you can do what you do. That's why this is important, because I didn't ask anybody else, could we go cover the rally black women had for Congresswoman Ilhan Omar? I asked myself. And that's why it's important for us to own our own stuff, to control our narrative. So we're not asking somebody else, can we please go cover black people? Uh, but the only way that can happen is if black people also support black media. And that's why we want you to join our Bring the Funk fan club. Uh, we would love for you uh, uh, to join. You can give via Cash App, PayPal, or even uh, via Square. We got all those different options. Uh, if you don't trust any of them, trust me, I got people who mailed in uh, uh, money orders and stuff along those lines. We can do that as well. But look, this is all about us, again, controlling our narrative. And in fact, tomorrow's show, I was going to do it today, but we went longer with John Singleton. I'm going to give, I'm going to have my interview with the president uh, of Bennett College. Remember, they were supposed to raise five million bucks. Can their accreditation they raised nine and a half million dollars and they still won't give it to them mm. now Bennett is suing the accreditation agency and so I have those details tomorrow on the show and of course we'll continue our tributes to John Singleton as well and so again rollermarkdownfilter.com if y'all want to see black news done by black people for black people controlled by black people be sure to support as well so I'll see y'all tomorrow How? <laughs>
you want to check out Roland Martin Unfiltered, youtube.com forward slash Roland S. Martin. And subscribe to our YouTube channel. There's only one daily digital show out here that keeps it black and keep it real. It's Roland Martin Unfiltered. See that name right there? Roland Martin Unfiltered. Like, share, subscribe to our YouTube channel. That's youtube.com forward slash Roland S. Martin. And don't forget to turn on your notifications so when we go live, you'll know it. Hey fam, want to check out Roland Martin Unfiltered, the blackest show on all of digital cable and broadcast. Want to check out our audio podcast. There's only one daily digital show out here that keeps it black and keep it real. It's Roland Martin Unfiltered. Press play. You want to support Roller Martin Unfiltered? Be sure to join our Bring the Funk fan club. Every dollar that you give to us supports our daily digital show. There's only one daily digital show out here that keeps it black and keep it real. As Roller Martin Unfiltered. Support the Roller Martin Unfiltered daily digital show by going to RollerMartinUnfiltered.com. Our goal is to get 20,000 of our fans contributing 50 bucks each for the whole year. You can make this possible. RollerMartinUnfiltered.com. <laughs>